uh, just give you a brief history so you know where all this kind of came from. Back uh, years ago, we worked for a company in town called uh, FDC, and there was a fire at, uh, I believe it was, it was 9 or 11 Greenway, I don't remember which one, over in Greenway Plaza. FDC had the service account on that building. Uh, there was a, a security guard, went up to the fire floor, <clears throat> excuse me, went up to the fire floor, got locked on the fire floor and couldn't figure out a way to get off of the fire floor. He was, fire floor. He was trapped in an elevator lobby. He ended up uh, uh, unfortunately dying in that fire. What ensued was three or four years of, of, of lawsuits. You know, once the lawyers get involved, they'll sue everybody in town. And out of that came the, uh, a lot of the new door lock codes that, that we see these days, you know, especially for the man traps in the elevator lobbies and, and, and whatnot. So that's kind of the history behind that. Um, so anyway, I'm going to turn it back, uh, back over to Keith. And uh, I thank you guys and I appreciate your hard work. All right. Yeah, thank you all for being here. That was a cool bit of history. I actually didn't know that. I learned that at the same time as y'all just now. But yeah, today we're going to be talking about door locks and to give you an overview of kind of what I'm going to do. I'm gonna show you a handful of different types of electronically controlled door locks. And then I'm gonna show you kind of a typical way a door is set up. And then the main focus of the technical side of what we're gonna talk about is going to be on how the fire alarm overrides this. A few different types we have. I'm gonna start in the bottom left and kind of work my way around. That picture down there is a crash bar. And you can have crash bars that have nothing to do with electronic locks. And you just, you walk up, you push the bar, the door opens, whether it's locked or not, and people can get out. It's a, it's a good means of free egress from the building. There's nothing impending it. But now they've started including electronic motors in there that whenever you do a keypad on the outside or card reader, it can actually operate that mechanism in the crash bar, still allowing you to have that, that free exit by pushing the bar but then you get all the benefits of the electronic lock control too. Another option above it is the electronically controlled door strikes. Now that's on the frame of the door, as you can see in part of the picture. There is on the right-hand side of the two, that's just a typical door strike like you'd find on any commercial door. And then on the left-hand side, the guy there is holding up an electronic replacement for it. And what happens is over right here, this part, when the, uh, when the lock is released, which would be by the keypad or the card reader, or if the fire alarm overrides it, this part actually folds back in and you can pull the door free without using a key to unlock it. And, and that has a lot of similar benefits as the crash bar style. You can still operate the door from the inside to turn the handle, pull to open or whatever. And then these four pictures are four different pictures of of magnetic locks. They're an electromagnet similar to what we talked about when I went over the overview for relays, just a coil of wire that's energized, creates an electromagnet, and then there's a steel bar. Yeah. What's shown is a few different ways they can be mounted and applied to some different doors. So up here, this is for a glass door. This is a way that it mounts to, if you have an all glass wall and all glass doors, it can still be done. Uh, here's a metal door where you can see that steel plate that the magnet attaches to, and this right here is the magnet. Right here is the same thing, but with a wood door, there's your, there's your plate, here's your magnet. And then right here, this was a different way of mounting it because the door in this case swings outwards. So it had to be mounted up on the door frame. Then there's these brackets that come up that still allow it to hold and allow the door to swing freely. Because if this one hung down, the magnet would actually get in the way of the door. So these are a handful of different ways that we can control the door locks, but they're not the only ways. There are some others. These are just really common. I just wanted you all to know what I'm talking about. If I say mag locks, I'm talking about these. If I say door strikes, I'm talking about these and crash bars are these. So right here, I have kind of a diagram that more or less a typical door setup. And this can be if it's the only access controlled door in the entire building, or if it's a school and almost every single door is access controlled. A few of the parts you have right here, you have an access control panel. This is going to be the brains of the operation and it'll also be your power supply. Um, I wanna take a second to stress that we never use the fire alarm system to power a door lock. We do have auxiliary power on our fire alarms, but the door locks are not UL listed to work as a fire alarm device. So they don't get powered by our system. They have to have their own completely separate power. Then right here, we have an emergency door release station this could be something that says press to exit, or it could be a pull station like I'll go over towards the end where, uh, like Mike was talking about with the man traps in the elevator lobbies. 
uh, we have a special thing we can do with some pull stations that allow us to actually break the power to the lock. So if you follow this line diagram here, it comes down from the access control panel. The power goes through the door release station and it comes up and then it powers the mag lock and then the negative just goes back to the access control panel. And so this is actually breaking the positive of the, the circuit. So even if all else fails and you know this board is fried and isn't taking inputs, this station still has the ability to break that circuit. Um, the next thing we see here is a door contact. This is a status indicator for the access control panel to let it know that the door was opened and is closed again. Uh, it can also double as a security intrusion type of thing. Um, this right here is the magnetic lock itself. And above that, we have the REX motion. REX means request to exit. And so this motion will be mounted on the, the ceiling inside the door on the protected side, pointed down the hallway, or it can be mounted on the wall above the door, still pointed in that same direction. So that as someone approaches the door, it de-energizes this magnetic lock and allows the door to move and you don't have to hit this emergency door release station or have the receptionist push this button. This is the request to exit or enter button that gets put at a receptionist desk. I've seen these used more to let someone enter than exit. Typically this uh, motion detector lets them exit freely, but it can also help if maybe they've stood at the door too long and the motion detector doesn't see them anymore, or if something has failed in the motion detector. And then that's also another reason for the emergency door release station. It's there so that in case either or both of these fail, you know, you can still get out. This green thing with the dotted line, this is actually installed on the outside of the controlled area. This will be your keypad or card reader to let you get in. And then the last thing is a little bit cut off in this picture, but it's the fire alarm panel and then they're just showing a single contact point. And typically we don't wire that directly to a fire alarm panel. We actually go to one of our addressable relays, which can commonly be installed right up here above the ceiling somewhere or in an IDF or MDF room, depending on what that building's needs are. If you have a building that just has the one door, like a bank or something, and they're only controlling maybe the back door to let employees in and out, chances are they don't have a super elaborate access control system. The brains might be in the, the keypad or card reader that they put on the wall, and there might just be a power supply mounted in the ceiling above it. In that case, we just put our, uh, our relay up there beside it, and the power goes from, uh, the negative will come from the power supply down to the lock, and then the positive will go from the power supply to the common, and then from the normally closed contact down to the lock. So that way it normally operates. And then whenever we go into alarm, we go to our off normal state, we open up that contact and the lock is de-energized. We do that with this part right here. And I have it shown wired with that common and normally closed. Also put the contact ratings on there. So if you are, a lot of mag locks uh, are gonna be powered by 12 or 24 volts. Um, when they do that, they're, they pull anywhere from a quarter of an amp all the way up to one amp. If, if you're running 12 or 24 or 30 volt DC, the contacts on this relay are rated for three amps. So there's plenty of safety room and all you need is this relay right here. You don't have to deal with an MR101 or anything like that. If your lock is powered by 120 volt AC, these contacts are only rated for a half amp at 120 volt. Anytime we work with any other contractor, we need to make sure that we're, we're coordinating with them. We know what kind of equipment they're using. We know what they're going to need from us. And in the case of door locks, we need to make sure that the relays we put in place are going to be able to handle the, uh, the current ratings of what's going through it. But 90% of the time, this is all you have to do for electronic locks is just put a single relay in where you can see I've got the SLC on the right-hand side, and that'll go off and attach to the rest of your SLC circuit. And then on the left-hand side, I'm using common two and normally closed two. And as I've talked about before, you could also use common one and normally closed one. In most cases, you're only going to need to put one of these in a single building. When you have that really simple setup that has that one door, of course, you're only going to need the one relay. That's pretty obvious. When you start getting into more elaborate settings, uh, something like a school where every door or nearly every door is access controlled, chances are you probably still only need this one relay and wire it up like this. And you, this is where it'll go in that MDF or IDF room as those schools or larger buildings. Because at that point, they have a more intelligent access control panel that they only need the one input say, hey, the fire alarm's active, unlock the, all the doors that have to do with egress.
And those are really handy because they can still leave things like server rooms or secure file rooms and things like that closed. But any door that has anything to do with an exit, they can open. And all that will be dealt with between the fire marshal and your access control contractor. And it's handled in the programming of the panel the same way us turning this relay on is handled in the, the programming of our panel. In cases where you have uh, a business occupancy that has multiple tenants, that is where you might have to put more than one of these relays in because different tenants will have their own individual access control systems. Most of the time, they're not going to be one giant system where all their door controls are all linked to each other. So if, say, you have a mid-rise that's five floors and one person has the whole third floor rented out with access control and a, a different company has the fourth floor. You know, they don't want the employees of the company on the fourth floor to be able to get into the third floor. They want to control that separately. And everywhere there's a different system, we have to put one of these relays in. And then kind of the last point I want to talk about using pool stations for the emergency override switch. So right here, I have a Gamewell pool station. This is actually not the addressable one that I'm using. This is a conventional pool station. And then you see beside it, there's a second switch that has six wires coming off the back. I have three going up one direction and three bent down going another direction. There are two different sides to this switch. And each of those groups of three wires that are arranged vertically there are two separate circuits. If you look over on the right-hand side, I have this diagram and terminals one, two, and three are connected to each other. Two will be your common. And then one and three will be your, your two different switch points. And then the same with four, five, and six. Five is your common. Four and six will be your two different switch points. They are in no way connected horizontally. So whatever you wire up to four, five, and six will have nothing to do with what is wired on one, two, and three. So this one switch allows us to control two separate things. And this replaces the switch that goes on the inside of the pool station itself. So that whenever you do that push in, pull down, that will activate this and it will perform two separate functions at one time. Um, a lot of people mistakenly refer to this as a double action pool station. And that's not true. What it is, is it is a double pull, double throw switch. A double action pool station means you push in and pull down. If this was a single action pool station, you would only pull down. It wouldn't require you to push in before you pulled down. So double action refers to how the pool station is activated. The double pull, double throw refers to what type of switch is in it. So for access control, it's no different than any other fire alarm application. For everything we do, we always need a double action pull station. That's what we use here. But for access control, we need the double pull, double throw. And this is only used in man traps. So an example of what a man trap is, that elevator lobby example Mike told us about is a, a great example. Um, and that's actually what I was going to use, but I didn't know that particular story. I was just gonna create a, a hypothetical building in your mind that has an elevator lobby in the center of the building. And then every elevator lobby, when you get up there, the whole floor is a tenant space and they put their access control right there on the wall of the elevator lobby where it would normally be open for you to walk out to the floor. There's now an access control door. So that as you go up to that floor and you step out of the elevator lobby, you have to page in an intercom to go anywhere other than the elevator lobby. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And there's a lot of buildings built this way. But if a fire breaks out somewhere else in that building and someone is in that elevator lobby and they're, uh, they're trying to get out and then the elevators recall and they walk back to the elevator and push the call button so that they can get out too, the elevator's not gonna come. They're gonna be stuck in that elevator lobby. That's called a man trap because there's no access to the stairwell without going through the tenant's lease space. So they can't get to the emergency exit and the way they came in is no longer available to get out. So they're trapped. So we use pool stations like this and we'll have one of these installed in that elevator lobby. And so you can see on this switch diagram right here, one side of this switch will wire up to uh, this is an end line resistor here, and this is the yellow and purple legs from your monitor module. I have another picture of that in just a second I'll show you. And so your pool station will still activate the fire alarm like normal. The other side of this right here is for that, that to release that electronic lock. So you see I have the access control power supply, your negative power leg coming down, coming over, hitting the lock, and then your positive wire is broken in this switch. So that whenever this is in its normal position, one and two is an open contact as well as four and five. And that's why you have this over here because the electricity will come in down your yellow 
and it'll come over here and it'll stop because this is open. And then it'll also hit this resistor, go across the resistor and return up the purple leg, completing the circuit, showing that everything is in normal condition. You know, I see the end line resistor, everything's fine. And then this one, the power will come from your access control and two and three, as well as five and six are your closed contacts. Your power comes in, goes from two, is able to go across the closed contact to three to power up the lock or then returns up the negative side of your circuit. And so everything is working absolutely normal. Your, lo your lock is turned on, your alarm is turned off. When this switch flips positions, this side closes and this side opens. So then you have this causing a short. So it goes from your yellow, takes the path of least resistance over here from terminal four to terminal five, where it returns to purple, skipping the resistor because the resistor is greater resistance, causing that short circuit that tells your monitor module, hey, there's an alarm going on here. And then this contact that used to be closed is now open. So that power that was coming through here, allowing the lock to stay powered up, is now opened up, turning off the lock. So before the person couldn't get to the stairwell through the tenant space, but by pulling that pull station, they've activated the fire alarm telling people, hey, we need to leave. And they've unlocked that door lock so that they can get out too and they won't die in that elevator lobby and they can get to the stairwell and hopefully make it to safety. So to show that to you in another way, here it is actually wired up. So here's my end line resistor. You see my yellow and purple legs. And then here's that switch actually installed. So you see it clips in where the other switch goes. These three legs right here are your terminals one, two, and three that go to your access control. These terminals over here are four, five, and six, where we're using four and five to land under here under the same screw terminal so that it can go through that switch like I just talked about. Um, something I want to note about terminals one and six, I'm going to go back to the previous slide real quick. You see one and six, I don't have any wires attaching to them, but this switch comes pre-built with these. What you need to do is you need to cut each one off and then put a, a wire nut over it separately. Don't tie terminal number one to terminal number six, because that'll then attach the two different sides of the switch together. And we don't want the access control power to feed into our monitor module that can cause false alarms, ground faults, and uh, fry some of our SLC components. We don't want that to happen. So make sure you don't accidentally tie those two together or even intentionally tie those two together. Just don't do it. Cap those off separately. So here's the switch again. I just don't have anything shown attaching to it. Right here, These, this is the circuit diagram way to draw out what's happening. So you remember I said two and three are connected to each other. You can see that connection right here. One and two are open. And when the switch flips, this bar will move and pivot up here, then connecting two and one, opening up three. And that's, that's why we said uh, attach your access control power to two and three so that it goes through and it normally works. And then whenever you flip the switch, it turns off. And then we said the opposite for the fire alarm, we wanted to use four and five because they're not normally connected. And when that switch flips, that bar will pivot up here and four and five will become connected, causing that alarm to happen. And then to show it just one more time, now you can see another angle of it wired up where you have all your wires and resistors going in as well as you can see that diagram of the whole picture of what's going on. This is important to know. This is something we have to do occasionally, but nine times out of 10, it's just going to be putting in that relay like we talked about earlier. And that's that'll be all you need to know most of the time. But in the case of man traps, we have to put these pull stations in like this with these double pull, double throw switches. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Do y'all have, uh, have any questions?